Um, the piece uh, I'm going to talk about is called Septet Number no. Two, Circle Ground. It's a subtitle. It's a piece I wrote um, for the Australia Ensemble, a commission from them in 1995, so it's 15 years ago, and uh, they gave the first performance of it in about August 1996. I think it was their 100th uh, subscription concert, although I was trying to work it out the other day and it didn't seem possible they could have done that many already by then. But um, Jeff, Jeff was nodding, so yeah. <laughs> so um, it's uh, a piece I wrote some years ago, but I thought what we'd do today is uh, walk through the piece in sections and then there'll be a performance in the second half of the, about 1.30 or so, we'll play the whole piece. So um, just by way of explanation about the title, and I'll come back to this, you'll see all the spirals on the screen there, um, the subtitle, Circle Ground. Um, the reference here is to what I do with the material, um, the circular way I deal with the material, particularly harmony, and the idea of a ground. Um, if you're at the concert on Tuesday where Jeff played um, Respiro Simple Ground, another piece with the word ground in it, its title, um, the idea is of a uh, harmonic process which is itself circular, which keeps returning on itself. And um, historically that was known as a ground bass form, a repeated um, sequence of chords. So I think the first place to start is actually just to hear the very opening of the piece. Um, it's uh, a piano solo, as you'll hear, and I'll put the score up so we can... Um, uh, you can follow if you're uh, interested. Let's see. So. <laughs> Okay. Now, obviously what you've heard is very lyrical and spacious, the music sustained. It basically just consists of arpeggiations of uh, three chords. And um, the other things that are important in the opening, the fact that it's a piano solo gives it a particular character. Um, the fact that the phrases are all separated by long gaps of silence, so there's a lot of space around each idea. Um, Something else uh, you'll find very typical of the piece is the way I alternate small groups of notes. So one time you might have C, F, B, and the next time you might have B, F, C. Tiny alterations, a constant sort of permutation of possibilities. Uh, it's rather, I think, rather like turning some object over in your hand. You know, you keep looking at it from a different perspective. Um, so there's continual tiny changes. Um, the sonorities, I think, are quite rich. Um, and it's quite tonal. There's a tonal center that's very evident. It's based on A, as you can hear, A in the bass mostly, and moves to F as well. And it just hangs around that major third mostly. So by beginning with a piano solo and, and also having some of the other features in that opening, uh, I was trying to establish a kind of character and mood which, was, uh, which would establish itself and create some sort of ideas which would need to be worked out in the course of the piece. So firstly, there's the fact that it is a piano solo. It creates a kind of uh, modular construction, a, a feeling of it being in a section before the next section begins with the strings entering. 
Another thing that's quite important in the overall shape of the piece are those few loud notes you heard there in the upper register of the piano, those ac accented 14 notes. They are a kind of um, uh, question mark, if you like, or a problem in the piece because otherwise the feeling is very lyrical and gentle, but then we have these quite abrupt, loud notes. And I think of that as being almost in a way the fundamental tension in the piece between this lyricism and spaciousness and then the kind of aggression almost, so these louder articulated notes. And I think that's what I like to think of as the way the piece works itself out, pulling between these two tensions. So let's pick it up then from the next start, next section 32 bar 32, where the strings come in and join essentially what is a repetition of the piano music but with the strings over and above it. Okay, we'll, we'll stop there. I wanted to get to uh, Arena's solo, the viola solo, because it's the first time then that another instrument besides um, the piano really established itself soloistically. I suppose the violin does at the beginning of that section, but it's immediately um, taken over by the whole string group. So I'm sort of m moving through the colours possible in a septet, uh, the strings both as a group and then as solos. One of the things I like to do a lot with chamber music in general um, that certainly in this piece, is the idea of exploring um, the individual qualities of each instrument. Um, personality, you might say, not based in any way particularly on the players, although um, sometimes it can be, it seems that way, but um, this is a kind of melancholy sound the viola has at this moment. Um, the viola is like the piano in a way, and its melody at this point is really outlining the notes of the chords, so arpeggiations. And indeed, that's what the strings have done in this little section. They've really just outlined the uh, harmony notes, as it were, uh, if we're using a tonal idea. And so by doing that, um, we get very large leaps in the strings. You'll have noticed leaps of a ninth particularly. And then um, third, uh, augmented fourth, and a perfect fifth. You get those intervals which I th find extremely expressive uh, because they're quite expansive um, sounds that they create. In a sense, perhaps not completely idiomatic for strings, but they do have a very sort of broad, kind of expansive quality, which I love. Now, when we get to the end of this section, we will have heard all three of the main chords. <laughs> but there's a fourth chord, which begins the next section. And just before we get to that, I've written down on a piece of paper for Bernadette to play the chords, just so you can hear the chords in their kind of pure state. So if you wouldn't mind just playing the first chord. Okay, so it's the important things for me in that chord are the ninth at the bottom, the semitones in the middle, and the open fifths at the top. And then the next chord. Again, a similar construction, dissonance in the middle, space at either end. And then, the, uh, I'm sorry, and notes in common from the previous chord. So rather like if you modulate in tonal music, you have notes in common, that's the principle of these. And the next one. Okay, now here we have the tension between a sharpened note and a flattened note, the C sharp and C natural. And uh, it's something I absolutely love. It's that, a, a wonderful sound, I think, because you have this purity of the open fifths at the top, but then this dissonance caused by a dissonance, uh, a C sharp further down. 
One of the things um, in this period for me, I've been very interested in Chopin and Ludoslowski, two Polish composers, as it happens, whose handling of dissonance is fantastic. And um, you might be surprised, at, uh, probably not at all surprised, to hear Chopin's name with regard to that, if you know the nocturnes, for example. They're often quite dissonant pieces, but the placing of dissonance in his piano textures makes for um, an impression that isn't actually harsh or kind of rough. Now, Ludoslowski, 20th century Polish composer, does something similar. He can take all 12 notes of a chromatic and space them in such a way that it doesn't actually feel dissonant. And this is something I've thought about a lot in this piece, is how to space dissonance, how to put um, physical space in the vertical arrangement of the harmonies to create an impression of consonants, even though it's actually quite dissonant. Then we get the fourth chord. And in fact, would you mind playing the third chord and then the fourth chord? Just... Okay, so the connection here is actually the C sharp, which moves from being the middle to being in the bass. And one of the things about this piece, which I didn't really hadn't really yet worked out completely in terms of later things, was that I stayed very much around these four chords tonally. In other words, I didn't have much in the way of transposition. Okay? You know, normally in tonal music, for example, you start with a harmonic idea or a melodic idea and it moves through a series of harmonic areas, keys. But in this one, I've, the whole piece, 18 minutes or so, I stay in one harmonic area, um, something I've since found ways of moving from. Now, um, with this moment where we get to this fourth chord, the piece changes. And I'm trying to use harmony here as a way of signalling larger scale events, as it were. So if we can just pick it up from bar um, 73, where the flute comes in. Okay, I'm going to stop there. Um, you'll hear the whole thing shortly. Um, this little section, I just want to show you what happens. You have this figure we've got to, which is rather lyrical, slow-moving um, chords. Then we come back to what we just really heard in the clarinet, flute and piano, based on that fourth chord. Now, the, the idea here is actually, within the section of the larger piece, you have a section which is itself made up of the same structure. So if you think of this piece as being in a big arch form, there's a little, little arch in the middle, and a lot of the piece is made up of smaller versions of the bigger structure. And this idea is, again, the idea of a circle. And uh, in this case, it's a spiral. And um, I just want to show you some... The idea for spirals, and started thinking about this, is quite odd in a way, because um, not that long before I wrote this piece, the um, Sydney Opera House car park, <laughs> you weren't expecting that, um, had been completed and revolutionised parking at the Sydney Opera House. Now, it also is very interesting because the original plan apparently was kind of a box structure like most car parks, but somewhere along the line it got changed, and there's a very interesting article about this I've come across. Um, and they changed it, and I was fascinated by this way that what they've come up with, which takes half as much space as the original plan. 
and it's, a, it's two helixes, two spirals, interlocking. Now, for, for some time when I'd go in Parker now, I used to worry that the whole thing would collapse because it felt to me a bit like it was simply not, you know, feasible. But it's quite a brilliant plan. This, if you can see, it is the design. Um, these spirals are fascinating things, and very economical in the use of space. I found in nature all over the place. And I started thinking about this, and I've for some time been very interested in the idea of spirals as an idea for musical form, given that we're adding this idea of duration being another element. Uh, time travel, time uh, passage. So, um, how would that work? Well, let me just show you another, another example. This is a spiral staircase from a chapel, apparently quite famous. I've never been there, but I've, this photo is quite nice. I, I, what's interesting to me is the idea that in a spiral, what you do is that, in a sense, you return to the same spot but at a different level. So you're kind of constantly moving but not really going anywhere. So, and I, I found that idea, that kind of concept, rather similar to what happens in music with the idea of recapitulation, returning, how you can come back to something, but you've actually been somewhere, but in a sense you're back where you started. So it's the kind of paradox uh, which I find very interesting. So what happens next in the piece is that we move into some fast-moving music. And um, I want to just have a little example of that and show you another spiral while we do it. So if we could pick it up from 126. I wonder if anyone was hypnotised. This is supposed to hypnotise you, this bit, this um, video. And it has a very scary zombie thing at the end to wake you up, but I couldn't do that to you. Um, so what you um, heard then was, it's really the same material, and it now is kind of breaking again into little circles or groups of three sections. And uh, it starts, as you can hear, with this kind of... Um, melodic figure, particularly in the two violins. Well, I was thinking of them as being very much like folk style playing, um, almost dueling violins as it were, you know, sort of um, with a drone A underlying it. Um, what we then get, and I'll see if I can get back to the score and show you, is um, a cello solo, and we'll just hear a, a little bit of that. Um, it's bar um, is it 230, thereabouts. And we'll just, maybe just pick it up a few bars before that, uh, somewhere where you're comfortable there. Um, just, you won't hear, we'll just hear the opening. <laughs> Sorry to stop, Julian. Um, the idea again, it's turning and looking at one part of the ensemble. So it's this ensemble versus solo thing happening again. The cello actually is quite soloistic in several points in the piece. And at this point, if you notice the notes that he's playing, we'll see sharps down the bottom. And it's, it's kind of a bit of a reflection of what the flute does earlier in the piece. It really kind of upsets the kind of established thing in the piece at that point. And it's this fourth chord again being used as a way to generate something new, some sort of dynamism in the piece, hopefully. 
So just um, then we get back to the other side of the circle again, or the spiral, and if we pick it up at uh, about bar 277, you'll hear what I mean. Builds up this section and then from about bar 383 it starts to turn back as it were to the uh, to the beginning. slow chordal passage um, that comes through now, this time in clarinet. Then towards the end, we're shaping towards the end, um, we come back to a passage which you'll hear from 406, sorry, 383, where are we up to? 406. Sorry, 406. 406. Um, you'll hear a mirror, as it were, of the opening piano solo, but this time accompanied by the instruments. Two more sections really towards the end. The first is at a tempo change, which is here. I'm not sure what Lala does in your score, but in my score it's. Uh, 477. Yeah, but four, I'm going to pick it up from about four, um, five, four in this one. Okay, you can hear then how the piano has come back with material from the opening now doubled. Uh, the, the arpeggiated notes are doubled by the strings particularly, but also flute and clarinet. Uh, it looks as though it's about to end, but there's a sort of surprise in the tail of the piece, which is that it opens up to a new section um, to try and give it a, a sense of uh, excitement at the end. And the sounds at the end, to me, are very much like the sounds of sirens. In major seconds you'll hear them as they come through. Um, now, just to close, I, before we play it, I wrote this piece, as I say, in 1995. I actually wrote it uh, in Canada, where I was um, having a, a stint at the Banff Centre for the Arts in the summer, northern summer. It's a very beautiful place, and I think when I listen to this piece now, I hear a kind of uh, something about the environment there. Was, in the studio I was working, had a very distinctive piano for a start, and I think that's um, influenced me. Kind of a cloistered, warm environment, even though it was 
Canada, it was summer, so it was very, very warm and uh, long daylight hours. So I, I kind of, for me, conjures that place very strongly when I hear this uh, music. Uh, so okay, if uh, you wouldn't mind, that'd be great.